pleasure to announce our next speaker, Stephen. Thanks. Uh, uh, happy to be here. Um, uh, yeah, we'll just jump right in. Uh, okay, so the paper I'm presenting is uh, one part of a larger overarching project, um, roughly to develop a new ontology for physical objects, not just material objects, but physical objects generally. Um, that's informed by our best uh, physical theories. Right, so if you do uh, primarily analytic metaphysics and not philosophy of science, uh, a lot of the work sort of just works with uh, physics as like little billiard balls bouncing against each other. Uh, and I find that different kinds of metaphysical problems arise within our best theories, and so we have to sort of reinvent the wheel in a way when we look at like, you know, today we're going to look at a theory of substances. Our theory of substances, you sort of have to start from the beginning again um, to, to address the kinds of problems that arise in our best physical theories. So this paper focuses on using a theory of substances to solve one particular problem in the metaphysics of relative physics of space times, um, namely the whole argument, uh, and offers a defense of space-time substitute hybrid, uh, namely the view that space-time exists and is a physical entity. That's what I'm Okay, so some basics on general relativity for those that are less familiar. Uh, so it's our best theory for understanding space-time. Um, uh, a solution in GR uh, consists of three parts. So we have the manifold, which is just like the set of points, all the things in the space time. Um, a metric, which describes the uh, relationships between those points, right? So distance relations, uh, straightness relations of curves, um, uh, which ones are GD6, uh, gravitational curvature, all of that is going to be sort of baked into our metric. And then the stress energy tensor, right? Which describes where the matter is and how it's sort of distributed matter and energy. Um, and then these are going to be constrained by the Einstein equations. So, you know, most famously, the uh, matter is going to tell space time how to bend, and then the bending of space time is going to tell us what the straightest paths are that are going to be inertial for the physical objects. Okay, so we have these three parts the manifold, the metric, and the stress energy tensor. Okay, so uh, importantly, within general relativity, uh, there are groups of solutions uh, that have the same representational power. Uh, which just means that they can represent uh, one in the same state of affairs as one. Uh, and so we can think of these kind of like projections of Earth on the maps, right? We have the uh, Mercator projection, the one that we're all familiar with, versus something like the Gull Peters projection. Uh, Gull Peters keeps the uh, land area of the continents the same, uh, whereas the Mercator projection keeps like, it's more conformal, so you get the right shapes. Um, Gull Peters for stretches stuff. And so we can get the same, we can represent one in the same world, right? It's a uh, globe. Um, and then if you know how the projection works, you can sort of reform uh, a representation of what the actual world is going to look like, what the globe is like. And then each of them is going to have sort of different features that it's going to have to, uh, uh, that you'll work through it when getting to it. Right? And so these are going to be uh, roughly, for general relativity, they're going to be called gauging curves. So one group of solutions in GR uh, that's of particular salience um, that has the same representational power are the diffeomorphisms. So a diffeomorphism uh, uh, on a solution in GR is going to yield another solution in GR. Um, and so especially what I'm interested in, uh, what the whole argument uh, is interested in, are called active diffeomorphisms, or sometimes push-forward mappings. Um, the literature is, uh, sort of blends the two. Um, and we can think of these as reassigning which points fall on which curves in space time. Right? Uh, so, uh, right, you can imagine, uh, you know, where the wrinkle is, I can sort of move my shirt underneath it, so the wrinkle sort of moves. All the metrical features, right, the bend in the shirt is the same. We're just changing which part of the shirt is going to fulfill the role of the bend. Uh, and so as long as all the metrical features are preserved, right, all the straight lines, not the straight lines, um, distances are the same between objects on the space-time. Um, general relativity is going to treat these as roughly the same uh, uh, representation. Right? They're going to treat them equivalently to one another. So they can be diffeomorphically related. Um, has the same representational power. You could represent this world with many, many different kinds of uh, 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 solutions in GR. Many different metrics, many different uh, uh, stress energy tensors. So, so um, and so one thing that kind of uh, helps people mind around it is we're sort of changing uh, the names of the points, right? So uh, if we're going to sort of shift the space around, you might think, uh, where is you know, 
this electron located, or it's located at point A, or if we sort of shift the space around, the world could look exactly the same, but oh, now it's occupying point B, should have shifted the points over in a way. So the whole argument itself, um, after getting all the, the background on it, uh, if space time exists, then, so this claims, indeterminism is going to follow. Uh, so if space time exists, so such typism is true, then space time points are physical entities. Right? That's just what it is for space uh, subset typism to be true. Whether some uh, object occupies some point at some time is going to be a physical fact. Right? There's a relationship between two physical objects. That's a physical fact. Uh, diffeomorphisms can disagree about future occupancy facts. This is where sort of the rub comes in. Um, so diffeomorphisms, uh, full diffeomorphisms, shown here, uh, are only going to non-trivially transform the metric within some finite region, what we call the whole, right? So area of H. So everything outside of H, exactly the same. And then inside of H, we sort of bend the space time enough so that the trajectory followed by gamma, it's not gamma and then uh, push forward mapping, um, uh, uh, exactly the same, except for an H, where we sort of bend it to miss the point P. And so, as long as the whole is sort of in the future, right, so we can imagine, you know, our electron is following at gamma, and uh, this is the current time slice, uh, as long as the whole is in the future, there's going to be some indeterminacy about whether or not the electron is going to occupy point P, or is not going to occupy point P. And so, since this is a physical fact, uh, general relativity is going to say, oh, well, there's no fact of the matter about what the future physical facts are going to be, uh, and that's roughly just indeterminacy. Um, and because these have the same exact representation power, they can represent the, the, the very same world, or all the things that are sort of possible, uh, according to GR, it's going to be indeterminacy. A little bit more formally, uh, so uh, if the metric represents a way the world could be, uh, then a push forward mapping of that same metric, or that, that same uh, solution in GR, also represents the way the very same world could be. Uh, if the metric represents the world, such that the space time point represented by P lies upon the trajectory represented by gamma, and relative to that model, the push forward mapping represents the world such that the space time point represented by P fails to lie upon the same trajectory now represented by some gamma. And then whether or not a space time point lies upon some trajectory is a physical fact. That's just in there. And so what we're going to get from that is that uh, uh, the original solution and the push forward mapping of the solution represent physically distinct ways that the world could be. One, two, three, five, six, five. And then from that, it's just going to be straightforward that we can just place the whole into the future and then indeterminate the okay. All the important stuff, though, happens in this first set of years. Okay, so. Um, we make this, the, we you know, find this finding. Uh, look, GR looks like it's going to be indeterministic. Uh, you might wonder, so what? Um, why is this bad for substance titleism? Why is this bad for general relativity? Um, you know, uh, indeterminism is the kind of thing that science might actually tell us. Right? So we can compare with the case of quantum mechanics. Right? Quantum mechanics, it's often taken to uh, be true. For, like The science tells us that indeterminism is the case. Um, Right. I mean, obviously, it's going to depend on your interpretation of quantum mechanics. But there are sort of genuine uh, uh, effects, right? So, like, you know, you send an electron through a certain Gerlach magnet, uh, and there's going to be these uh, uh, probabilistic events, right? Whether or not the electron is going to deflect up or is going to deflect down looks to be entirely probabilistic. We don't know of any uh, deterministic mechanics that are going to tell us which way it's going to go. Um, maybe there are hidden variables, but maybe not. Um, and so it seems like. Well, look, there are genuine cases where indeterminism seems to be fine. And so why can't that be the case in our uh, general relativity as well? OK, so uh, claim. Uh, if we're going to accept indeterminism, it ought to be on the grounds of our physics, and not just the metaphysics that we're importing. Okay. So the formalism of quantum mechanics suggests that the indeterminism may be there. Right? This, uh, the two different uh, uh, schemes, right? so the uh, Schrodinger equation and collapse mechanic, right? The, the tension between the two of those suggests that indeterminism might actually be in the machine, in the sort of the mechanics itself, whereas that just simply isn't the case for general relativity, right? All of the laws seem to be entirely deterministic. We can calculate forward as far as we want. We can calculate backward as far as we want to. Um, and so if we're going to say, okay, well, general relativity, it's true, is going to uh, 
applying determinism. That seems like a very odd move to make if nothing about anything the physicists say uh, indicates that it ought to be indeterministic. Right? So it shouldn't just be that the metaphysicians come along afterward and say, aha, uh, I guess it's indeterministic because of my extra metaphysical assumptions. And so if we have multiple options, uh, which there are other options for uh, space-time ontologies that don't have this problem, uh, better to go with the metaphysics that doesn't sally you with more baggage, doesn't sally you with determinism for general life. So, uh, whole argument, actually a problem for subsentitalism. Okay, so where does the problem come from? Why is it problematic? Uh, where does the problem arise within subsentitalism itself? Because it doesn't seem to be the problem with GR. GR is uh, deterministic. So it must be coming from our uh, subsentitalism. And so I think there are features of substances as we understand them traditionally, uh, that cause these problems. Uh, so the traditional view comes to us roughly from Locke. Um, so sometimes we're going to call them Lockean substances, or traditional substances. Um, but for our purposes, right, they have lots of features, but for our purposes, I'll focus on two. Uh, one, they're spatially limited. So they're located within some finite region of space time. Um, so we can think of a rug. The rug is sort of my go-to example. Um, there's sort of there's edges to the rug. There's a depth to the rug. I cannot be on the rug, or I can be on the rug, um, and so uh, uh, that's just straightforwardly not the case with space time. It seems like right space time is sort of all the places, and so there's a kind of mismatch already in sort of the way that we learn about substances. If we learn about substances by looking at rugs and looking at tables and looking at people, we're not necessarily going to get the, the sort of features of space time. And the other one, uh, substances are hexaeotistic, um, namely they, they contain a hexaity or primitive business. They're sort of a, a what it is to be that particular thing. These are often going to be non-qualitative features. Um, so you could have the exact same uh, uh, set of qualities, but have a different object there um, just by sort of switching out the hexaity. So two different possible worlds look the exact same, uh, but whether or not this is rug A or rug B will sort of just uh, could be a distinguishing factor between and hexades, uh, originally, so in, in Newton, he introduces, uh, uh, in Scully, introduces hexades for space-time. Um, Locke introduces hexades for uh, 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 material objects. Um, and they're usually used to identify objects across possibilities, regardless of qualitative changes. That's why we're introducing them. But again, if we're learning about substances from things like rugs, tables, people, that might not fit nicely with our best scientific theories and what they might tell us are substances of life. So something like Lockean substances do work generally fine for familiar objects. There are issues, but most of them are, are avoidable. Um, uh, but it's these two assumptions, uh, I think, that lead to the whole argument itself, lead to the, the problematic conclusions of the whole argument. Right? Namely, there's a point over here, there's a point over there, uh, and there's a fact about sort of which uh, point the electron's going to pass through, right? which one uh, the trajectory lies upon. Right? And so that ability to sort of track across the diffeomorphisms, um, across these different possibilities, where the one point is and where it isn't, that's what's going to cause the problem. That's the basis of all work. Okay, so uh, my sort of uh, uh, suggestion. Um, so if the traditional view comes through Locke, I think we can go back to Spinoza instead. Um, uh, not exactly, but uh, something like that. So uh, neo-spinicism, uh, which is my view of substances, uh, unifies objects of one kind into a single substance. Uh, unifies it into sort of like one big sheet, so to speak. So that big sheet will express certain modes of being in uh, places where we see objects, and different kinds of modes of beings where we don't see objects. Right. So we can imagine the case of a rug. You might think. Uh, the rug is flat, you might be uh, boring, I don't really think about the rug, until you see a wrinkle in the rug. And then you have to think, okay, now I, I, you know, I don't want to trip on the wrinkle in the rug. And so I'm going to call that a wrinkle, even though all that's really there is just the rug. And then it sort of has a certain mode of being. It's, it's uh, bent or kinked in the middle. Okay. Um, so uh, neospinicism, neospinicism is going to unify uh, objects of a kind. Uh, the substances are going to be everywhere present. So uh, closer to uh, field theories, right? general relativity thinks space-times all the spaces and times. Uh, and then something like 
quantum field theory is going to say, look, there's an electron field. The electron field is everywhere. Uh, anytime you see an electron, it's a part of the electron field. And so we get this nice sort of overlaying of different fields on top of one another. And neospinicism sort of recognizes that and says, okay, look, substance, 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 substance. Um, and sort of uh, it's going to unify them everywhere that they are. Uh, and then uh, this is the, the important bit that's going to get us out of the hexades is the whole will have a kind of metaphysical priority over any of its parts. So the priority of the whole uh, will, will roughly move us away from thinking about the individual points that are causing the problems in the whole argument um, and start thinking about sort of the space as a whole. Uh, and then, like I said, different kinds of entities are going to have different substances. So all electrons, potentially positrons, will be unified in the electron substance. All the space-time points are going to be unified in the space-time substance. Uh, and so we can think about sort of different levels of uh, description for that. Okay, so here's the claim, um, sort of the central claim of the paper. Uh, the metaphysical priority at play in the view, right? So what kind of metaphysical priority we think uh, uh, is at work in our neospinicism will either uh, straightforwardly imply or at the very least suggest or make more plausible anti-hexaidism, to deny that entities have hexaidism. And so what I'm going to do uh, with the remaining time is uh, uh, walk through a myriological interpretation of the uh, metaphysical priority at play in neospinicism. Um, I think there's uh, an explanatory version as well, but we can maybe talk about that at the end. So, the neurological interpretation. So, the whole of space time has metaphysical priority over its parts, all the subregions, uh, I should say subregions, not the parts, uh, because space time is myriologically simple. And so, there just are no proper subregions to exist. Right? This would be one way to have metaphysical priority of the whole over the parts. Uh, there just are no parts. Um, uh, of course, the whole is going to be prior in that case. So this will give us anti-hexaitism trivially, right? If there are no points, then there are no hexaides for the points. Uh, and so uh, we can refer to the proper subregions uh, and sort of relations within the space-time by talking about relations between modes on the space-time. And we can think of those modes as conceptual parts, ways that we sort of carve up the world in our own minds, but that don't sort of carve the world at the joints. So to speak, right? There are no points, there are no um, gravitational wells. They're just sort of bends in the one substance, and we sort of recognize them as wells. Um, and we can kind of think of this as like, again, the wrinkle on the rug. We usually don't think of wrinkles as sort of independently existing entities. We think of them as wrinkles. We sort of recognize where they are, but there aren't hard boundaries on them. They don't have really identity conditions, per se. Um, they're just sort of there. Okay. So uh, this is going to get out of the whole argument. Why? Uh, with no points, the difference between the two uh, diffeomorphisms, the two cases, is dissolved. Right? Uh, you might wonder, you know, does gamma pass through P? Well, look, P doesn't exist. So the answer is no, it doesn't pass through P. Right? And there's the, uh, on the diffeomorphism, right, what is maintained? Uh, the metric is maintained. Uh, the uh, stress energy tensor is maintained. And, you know, the manifold as a whole is maintained. The only thing that's changing are the relations of the points. Right? But if we do away with the points, everything else that's maintained on the uh, diffeomorphisms is maintained on the myriological interpretation of the spinicism. And so we can go, you know, go wild with your diffeomorphisms. We're never going to get a whole argument case that's going to arise. Okay. And then I have one final uh, dialectical point that I want to go over. Um, so somebody might be uh, concerned that the view I offer fails to be subsentitalist, sort of uh, in, in a kind of rigorous way. Um, this certainly is not the view that was uh, the original target of the whole argument. Um, the original target is something like the Lockean view of substances. Uh, and so, uh, uh, my view is certainly a lot weirder than that. Um, uh, and so, it's a genuine question whether or not my view sort of overcomes the whole world, whether it's sort of defeated uh, Ehrman and Norton who presented. So, what I want to do is sort of rethink about, uh, reconceive of the whole argument, not as an argument against substantivalism, but as an argument that presents a, a strict new condition on any future metaphysical view of space. So in addition to preserving the phenomenon, or 
phenomena and explaining the dynamical nature of space-time, a theory must also preserve the conventionality in the choice of solutions in general relativity. Physicists, right? in fact, do. You know, they'll just pick whatever diffeomorphism uh, of a system is most useful. Right? So they, in fact, do. Uh, you know, they have this conventionality uh, in their choice of solutions along you know, whatever gauge symmetry they like, including the diffeomorphisms. And so we want to respect that. That's roughly what I think Einstein originally and then Newman and Norman gave that. And so the whole argument shows that traditional substantivalism, a lot in the of substances, is going to fail. Right? It can't rise to the challenge. Uh, and it's going to lead to something like indeterminism uh, if we sort of stay on that route. And then I argue in the paper, uh, neo spinosa substances can meet this condition and are thus worth considering for more, uh, 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 to worth considering developing further for our, our metaphysics of general two. And obviously it's going to be a kind of a, a project to figure out what exactly the metaphysical priority at work is. Right, so that's sort of the, the central question. And I presented one interpretation, but there could be others. I think there are others. And so if we can sort of develop those and see exactly how the priority works, how the relationship between the whole and the modes uh, uh, functions, we can get sort of a plurality of uh, neo spinicisms that can sort of give us a So much, Stephen. So, um, uh, so, well, how about pronounce your last name? Connect. 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 Great. So, uh, so, uh, so, uh, Stephen Connect presents this uh, novel kind of tribalism, which is an example of the neos the kind of substances, which is specifically also an important for solving so whole an, an account of my favorite or second favorite substance, um, space time. Um, so, uh, roughly. Uh, this is responding to this whole argument of problem, which we can, uh, which as uh, breaks down into these three premises. I'm going to pr present them in like a very hand wavy way rather than a sort of technical way. Roughly, you got, you got your two, premise one, you got your two uh, uh, solutions to the Einstein field equations, uh, and they both represent some way the world could be, where we're neutral, whether or not that's a different way. Uh, premise two, Here's one thing that they do disagree about. They disagree about particular with this particular space-time point P, whether or not it's on this one trajectory. Uh, three, whether or not a given space-time point is on a particular trajectory is a genuine physical fact, hence uh, they are distinct uh, representations of different ways the world could be. Um, and that is a problem for all of the reasons that Stephen said his solution falls within a category that denies that premise too. They deny uh, that the two worlds described, that the, that the possible worlds described by uh, uh, by these two solutions to the Einstein field equations uh, are worlds that genuinely have the very same point located either on or not on that trajectory. Instead, it will uh, turn out on today's view that. Uh, there, in fact, no, there are no such different worlds where you can identify the same point across uh, across these two uh, across these two possible worlds and say, oh, that's one and the same point that's on the trajectory in world one and off the trajectory in world two, and then, uh, as in the pictures and uh, presentation. This is actually a somewhat um, uh, familiar sort of uh, objection. So we've seen versions of this before, uh, notably. Uh, the views that are sometimes called uh, sophisticated substantivalists, uh, so Bellet and Ehrman use that term, or the Rickles calls this the modalist term in, uh, uh, in substantivalist theories of space-time, are ones that basically amount to just take your ordinary space-time, what you might have called the kind of Lockean uh, kind of substance for a theory of space-time, and then tack onto it this extra clause, where the extra clause is just, oh, by the way, there's no hexades or transworld identity of points. 
right? That's the like the little thing you add at the end to make yourself sophisticated. Um, and in doing so, avoid the whole argument and the um, static life and shifts and all these other things. I'm not a fan of the sophisticated subtitles for a bunch of reasons. I'm going to actually quote myself from a, a paper from 2017, both uh, uh, talking about the sophisticated subtitles. Quote. Modal facts obtain in virtue of the natures of the actual. Nixon could have been a butcher, but he could not have been a ham sandwich uh, because of the thing he actually was, right, which is a human being. Uh, likewise, uh, you can't just introduce a theory by saying it's subsentitalism about the actual world, but also it has different modal commitments uh, for space time points that allow us to solve these problems. That's not a theory, that's a desideratum. Right? Um, if you want a theory, you actually have to introduce some new metaphysics into your account of what space-time is like that will output that kind of motor profile. If you can't get that motor profile, uh, if you can't get that motor profile without doing some other metaphysics, then it's not clear kind of what game we're playing. Uh, today's view uh, in this respect is a view after my own heart because he offers a very big change in the metaphysics of space-time uh, that is uh, one, in keeping what I, with what I sometimes call the guiding conceit of subsentitalism, which is this idea that uh, what we're doing with our, when you're a subtitlist is that our metaphysics of uh, space or space-time and the parts of space-time should correspond to, as closely as possible, kind of what our metaphysics of material, concrete objects and things are. Right? We're supposed to be saying that space is another one of those, and so uh, this general spinosis to complex substances is one that is uh, uh, that it seems to be able to be uh, treating space-time in a different way, but in a way that is still consistent with that being a kind of way to treat uh, physical material objects. Otherwise, but it's also able to support this modalist trend that is able to deny the trans-world identity of points or deny their than having these anxieties, which means we can't formulate things like the whole argument. Uh, with them. The specific version that he uh, defends of the uh, Neo Spinoza view, he calls the very logical interpretation, on in which the totality of space time is this one great big neurological simple, and then all of the things we thought were parts of and subregions of the space time are in fact these modes that are expressed, and they are merely, I keep wanting to say expressed in parts or in places, you can't say any of that. So it's there sort of expressed by it, but in ways that are restricted in some sense, but not in a spatial temporal sense, just kind of restricted. Um, and that these are mere conceptual parts, ways of kind of dividing up the world, but really, if we were doing our proper metaphysics, we just see the one great big um, simple that is everywhere present and, um, and expresses these particular modes. And I keep wanting to say expresses them in places uh, there are different ways depending on where you are. That's not the right, it's just it expresses many, many of them and we only encounter some of them, and that's what we're treating these different endings. Um, on this picture, the total space-time is prior to all of its modes, and uh, the parts of space-time aren't really a thing at all. Um, and if you don't have the parts of space-time, if you don't have those points, then you're definitely not going to be able to formulate uh, the whole argument, or indeed a lot of other problems uh, that sometimes get raised for uh, some timelists. And that's pretty cool. Um, it's an interesting view because it does, uh, and uh, kind of raises this issue at the end, that you might worry about being a, an anti-realist about almost every spatial temporal entity except for the big one, right? Um, but at the same time, it's that the, uh, you could easily just rephrase a lot of what was happening here as giving you like uh, just a really, really uh, deflationary account of what it is to be a a subregion, right? So you could you could get yourself a little closer to uh, something that looks more a bit more like that. Let me um, end by just going through a few questions um, uh, about both this view and how it relates to some other views to give you a better uh, idea. The first one is I'm not really sure what it means for something to be everywhere present, um, partially because like I maybe am not. Uh, I'm not very familiar with thinking in terms of really, really big symbols, and so my, my brain just keeps thinking, like, oh, well, I mean, there's being a really big thing that has parts everywhere, right? Like, you know, you might think of it, this room is a really big room, and so part of this room's over here. It's not that the whole room's present here. It's not, and so it wasn't super clear to me whether or not everywhere present meant something deeper than that. 
um, or if it was just one that was supposed to be neutral between whether you have parts or not. Uh, uh, as a kind of follow up, and that's because I think maybe this that distinction might be the answer as to uh, if the answer to this question is no, this, that previous distinction might be what's doing the work there. Uh, would my uh, the view I defend in 2017, which I call space-time globalism, in which the whole of space-time is a fundamental entity, and the parts of space-time, the regions and points, exist in virtue of the whole having uh, certain fundamental properties, uh, uh, would this count as a neo-Spinozist account of space-time? Uh, it seems to meet at least the criterion of the sort of whole being prior to parts, and is also one that uh, I argue, at least in that paper, uh, should be able to avoid uh, uh, things in the same category as uh, static Leibniz shifts, as well as the whole argument, uh, because all of those rely on this, um, uh, the transworld identity of points, and if the points are grounded in the total space-time, as long as you have the same total space-time, you fully specify all the fundamental th spatial temporal facts, and then all of the non-fundamental ones you kind of get for free, and so you can't start swapping out those non-fundamental facts and getting a different possibility. Uh, second similar claim, would uh, Maudlin's 1988 uh, view that he mentions but not accepts called uh, uh, the ramifying subsentitalist, uh, which is a subsentitalist that basically uh, does not have any, a different account of the metaphysics of uh, subsentitled space-time, but instead just says this wacky thing that like, oh, any claim about location or, uh, or occupation must first be fully ramified out before you like can express its metaphysical import. And so you can't just can't mention the names, so to speak, of any of the actual parts of space-time. Um, this is a sort of like a cheesy view that Maudlin describes as like, here's a rogue subtitleist who could avoid the whole problem, but it's such a weird view, don't worry about it. Um, a lot of the weirdness is that it avoids things that I think it's worth avoiding. But um, uh, is that thing a uh, neo spinozist view? I feel like the answer to that might be no, just because there's no different underlying metaphysics uh, uh, that underpins that ramification rule, but I might be wrong there. Uh, second series of questions, where did the modes come from? They're coming from the whole, in the case of the uh, neurological interpretation, so the whole expresses these modes. Are they independent of one another? Do they have uh, I worry that a lot of the, uh, the problems that get raised for relationalists, like these sort of conspiracies of, well, if you've got like 17 points, there's this weird thing that all of their relations have to kind of agree with each other, right? You can't be, uh, you can't be like 17 miles away from all of these points, uh, and having all of those points be all, you know, be 17 miles away from one another, but you're also right next to three of them, right? Like there's just certain specific requirements about uh, how distance relationships and metrical relationships are distributed in the world, and it seems like these modes are supposed to correspond at least some of those. Um, it's not that, that there would be some dependence between them. Is that the kind of thing that we'll be able to get on this view? Um, or who can do it? A related problem to this is um, you might worry that having a fundamental difference between the kind of things that the parts of space-time are and the total space-time are um, will put you into some uh, awkward positions if you want to be able to countenance claims like, oh, there could have been a space-time that's just like the, the sort of first, if we, uh, the first half of this universe, uh, but then it kind of just stuck to like this moment, right? Um, or imagine they the run some very version of it. So. Um, uh, that sort of claim, that that could have been the entirety of space-time, just that whole part up until some particular slice. But, that's not even the, like that's a category mistake on your view, right? That's not even a properly speaking a thing, right? That's just a conceptual way of cutting up our descriptions of the big simple, right? It's not, clear. but um, if you've got an account that allows to t allows us to talk about those parts, then you are able to say, oh yeah, you could have had that thing be the whole space time, um, and so it treats the um, uh, the parts of the whole of space time as still being in the same uh, ontological category, even if it still allows for uh, the whole to be part of the parts. Um, and, oh yeah, that's it. The, my, uh, my last question was actually uh, covered in, the, um, in that final slide, which was about whether or not the sort of, um, uh, whether or not the, uh, the specific amount of realism about so many of the parts is going to mean that you're, uh, 
uh, losing some of the advantages of social dependence, but I think you answered that. for something to be ever present. Um, well, it's weird for space-time itself. Um, uh, so the first neospinicism that I did in uh, the tiny paper um, was for quantum fields. And so there it made a lot more sense. Um, there's all these wares, and all of the wares have the, you know, the electron field, uh, or the electromagnetic field, or whatever we're talking about. For space-time itself, it's a little bit weirder. Um, but I mean, we can think about it roughly as just like all of the potential locations, um, or something like that. Uh, for any occupancy relation whatsoever, uh, the second relata is always space time, uh, the, the entire thing. So I think that there are ways to, to conceive of it, um, or maybe I have to you know, nudge the language of exactly how I formulate them if we're present. Um, Spinoza talks about being infinite. Um, you just say it's, it's at all of the wares. Um, which seems true of the uh, uh, neospinous of substances. Um, so I think there's a way to do it, but maybe maybe the language is a little bit coarse uh, in the way that I present it. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, would your space-time globalism be uh, uh, neospinous? I think so. Uh, so welcome to the club. Uh, so uh, I have a, a bonus slide, and, and, and we can talk about this as much or as little as people are interested. But I think we can, um, if we take something like Schaffer's uh, explanatory priority of the whole view. Um, not the full monism, but just say, look, uh, space-time as a whole has explanatory priority over any of its parts. We can have something that looks a lot closer to a uh, Lockean substance, where we have parts, we have regions, we have the whole substance. Um, and then roughly anything that points to, or anything that regions do in our theory, look, I can dispense with those. Uh, I can just say it's the, the, the features of the entire substance. right? Uh, you might say something like, look, why does uh, the laser interferometer uh, uh, get brighter and get darker? Well, it's because of the contraction of the region that the, uh, the laser arms uh, uh, occupy. All right, well, what I can say is, well, look, it's the uh, expansion and contraction of space-time at the laser interferometer. Right, so if I can uh, reduce away talk about, uh, uh, or dispense with talk about the points in our theories, then like, I, like, I don't have any reason to have it say these for the points. Maybe they exist, um, maybe they don't, and then you'll go in the sort of neurological direction. But if they do exist, then they sort of don't rise to the level of requiring hexades. So this would be a view on which hexades are not, um, uh, anti-hexadism is not implied by the theory, but it is made more plausible, uh, right? By just removing all of the uh, talk about points from the theory itself, uh, it makes more plausible the removal of the hexades. So I think that's uh, sort of a fine way to, to do it. Uh, I also don't like the, the, the ramsifying substantivalist. Um, and yeah, I think because it's not changing the metaphysics at all, I, I would say it sort of doesn't fall into the camp. Um, yeah, I think you gotta, I, I agree. You gotta, you gotta change the metaphysics in order to, to really solve the problem. Uh, where do the modes come from? Uh, they come from the substance. Uh, uh, so, just like general relativity, right? Where does, um, where does the, the metrical features of the space come from? The stuff in the space time. Right, so one thing that I think uh, is helpful for thinking about uh, neospinous as space times is thinking about stuff in the neospinous as space times. Right, you can't like pull the two apart easily. Um, and so if we have you know, an electron, that electron is going to have an effect on the space time. And so that's where we're going to get these sort of curves, these bumps. Um, uh, are they independent of, of one another? Uh, they're independent of one another in the sense that one can exist and then the other could go out of existence. Uh, right? You could have you know, two wrinkles in a rug. Uh, you could sort of swish one of them and the other one could still persist. Um, but they're both parts of the same stuff. Um, so these worries about like uh, how do we ground the relationships between them, well, they're just constraints on the uh, distribution of properties in the space time zone. Uh, if we're on the, the sort of the neurological interpretation, or if you take something like this, uh, uh, no sort of worries there at all, right? because we can talk about um, the properties of the points or of the region themselves. Um, but I think that we can still get around these problems, even on the neurological interpretation. Uh, 
uh, uh, uh, problems with differences in the kinds of entities. Um, I think that we can, uh, I guess a couple of ways that we can get around this, but I think we can, uh, Maudlin's move, uh, so Maudlin talks about uh, metrical essentialism, um, so he thinks uh, uh, space-time has its metric essentially, um, so if you sort of you know, had my arm been slightly further over, its gravitational effect would have changed the metric, uh, and that would be an entirely different space time. Right? And so what he says is, look, it's not the case that were my arm further over, this very space time would have a different metric. He thinks, had my arm been over further, uh, then we would have occupied a space time, which had a slightly different metric, but it'd be a different space time. So he thinks the space time as a whole has the same steady, and we're just changing every single time. So if the worry is like, well, what if we were in, you know, uh, what if this classroom was the entirety of space time? Um, we could just say, what's well, a different space time? Um, there's no real need to identify the two. We could say, what if the natural properties were all the same? What if the stress energy tensor was exactly the same? Um, but, but I don't think there's necessarily a need to identify the space times across possibilities, so long as there's a space time, um, sort of a way the world could be that allows for it. Or we just talk about boundaries on space time. So, uh, we can talk about that more if you're interested. Um, and then you said I got the last question. Great. So I think I got I got all the, the did I answer all the questions? Okay. Awesome. Wonderful. Um, okay. Uh, that's it. So an active transformation is what we call put forward transformation where we, where we change uh, physical stuff relative to space time, whereas passive transformation is a longer transformation, a different perspective on an unchanged physical situation. So that's how we get around, get, get around the whole argument. But uh, so that's fine, but now we no longer distinguish active and passive transformations. And um, that's what we need. Uh, in order to solve the rotating bucket problem, uh, both in Newtonian mechanics and then the way it, uh, it reappears in relativistic uh, theory. And given that, 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 that the ability to solve the, the rotating bucket problem is, is the main reason to be a space time substance, substance in the first place, um, if we can no longer do that, <laughs> So it seems that, okay, so it's fine now. Now we don't have the whole problem, but now we have to say something different about the rotating bucket. Yeah, so I think um, I think there might be a way to, to keep the two distinct active and, and passive transformations. Um, I just don't know if the active transformations are going to yield separate possibilities. Um, so we can sort of conceive of them as different, uh, but the active transformations are going to correspond to sort of real metaphysical differences. Between so, so that, that, I don't really believe that the defining feature of an active transformation it takes it from one possibility to distinct possibility. Okay, yeah, so if that's the if that's the criterion, um, then yeah, uh, there, there might just not be any active transformations. Um, uh, it might collapse the two. Um, uh, uh, I think we could uh, avail ourselves of whatever solutions the, the relationalist uh, uses. I don't think that necessarily the, the bucket problems the only or, or sort of the, the primary motivation for substantivalism over uh, relationalism. Um, right? I, I mean, I think the thing that moves me is something like, look, space-time bends, it contracts, uh, it causes the interferometer to get brighter and darker. Um, those are just characteristically substantival things. Um, and so there's a sense in which it feels like we should, we should start from substantivalism, and then if we can't figure that out, if there's sort of problems with that, then okay, well, I guess we're stuck. Um, and so I think I can solve a lot of the problems that are distinctive of substantivalism, um, but certainly I'll have to I'll have to think more seriously about this this issue of the, the bucket problem um, because that that would be a genuine problem. I mean, that's a kind of an empty space time. You have a rotating bucket, and another yeah. empty space time. You have a non-rotating bucket. Those should be kind of observationally distinct. Yeah. So I think. Yeah, I mean, the relationalist move, right, is to say that it's, it's relations to everything else. And so you could say something like, well, it's relations to the other modes on the space-time. 
But you know, what if it's a, a lonely bucket in the universe and, and it's, uh, it's a universe with just one bucket uh, and nothing else and it's a totally flat space? Um, maybe. Um, uh, uh, I think we have a thoroughgoing neospinicism with a bunch of fields on top of each other with non-zero values. Um, we might be able to get out of the problem. Um, and then that would be a problem for the neurological interpretation only, something like the explanatory account or space-time globalism. Um, we'll get around that just fine. They can talk about um, what if the, well, let's see, no, maybe it can't. Maybe globalism also renders this problem. Because um, the active dimorphisms are going to constitute different possibilities. Okay, yeah, that's super interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I was also worried about throwing out a baby with a baby. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't look like I can say things like, on, on the neurological interpretation, I'm not sure about the explanatory priority version, but it doesn't look like I can say things like, there's a black hole located at this particular space-time region because there are no space-time regions, so I can't even say that sort of thing. But those sorts of things look like important things to say, and not just sort of, you know, for metaphysical reasons, but for like experimental physics reasons. You want to be able to say that an experiment is happening here, not over here, and a reading is happening here, not over here. You can't say any of that stuff. I guess you're going to have to reconstruct it somehow using this sort of notion of conceptual parts. But like, I don't know, once you've done all that work, you really just what the points back and the reasons back? Um, yeah, so I think there's a couple of things that we can do here. Um, yeah. One, one is just what I what I mentioned here, which is just go with the conceptual parts. Right? We can say uh, the the gravity the black hole is located at that mode, um, right? There's this massive dip in space time. That's where the the black hole is, um, and so we can use the modes to sort of uh, pinpoint where it is. Um, you know, we can talk about where objects are relative to other objects. Um, and so in that way, it can be a little bit relationalist. Um, we can sort of take their tools to, to do all the work. Uh, the other thing, and I, I have, this is much less fleshed out, but I think we might be able to get uh, uh, weakly emergent decomposition laws. Um, so if you're okay with things like composition, uh, uh, I mean, I've always been a tiny bit skeptical. Um, but if you're okay with things weakly emerging, um, you could say something like, uh, look, the regions weakly emerge based on decomposition laws for the, uh, the substance as a whole. They wouldn't be parts, right? Parts have a particular kind of relationship to uh, wholes, um, but they might still exist, so we might be able to like, reintroduce them. But being weakly emergent, the things that emerge would be, I think we have good reason to not Give the next um, Very similar to the explanatory account, where look, we can we can sort of remove uh, talk about them um, without sort of missing too much in the theory, um, and so they sort of don't rise to the level of requiring hexaity. So I think we might be able to. So I think no matter what, we can recover the talk that we need to do physics. Um, I don't think that's necessarily an issue. If you really like regions and you want to be able to talk about them not as conceptual parts. Um, I think you might be able to get decomposition views, or you can take something like the explanatory uh, account. Uh, and so I think there's there's options. I think that plurality is kind of kind of nice because a lot of people I talk to really don't like the muriological stuff. Um, that's nuts. That's not substantivism. Uh, and so I'm like, yeah, sure. Um, about a thousand flowers. Of thanks. Thanks. Yeah, and thanks for the talk. So I wanted to ask you something about uh, how your view compares to like a recent trend in the false argument literature, like in the last two years or so. There've been a lot of kind of papers in which the the I guess they are trying to say, look, you have the math here, and you have the physics here, and all these things about the theomorphisms and all of that. That's just about the math side of things. And if you know how the math is used, and if you look at how mathematicians actually think of the theomorphisms and all these kinds of transformations, if you pay attention to, to how I guess it is used in practice, you will see things like, oh, they will take points or sets related by the theomorphisms. That's actually represented the very same thing. Uh, but that's just coming from the math, like kind of. Uh, and then these different trajectories that you are putting there, mm -hmm are just different mathematical uh, models, right? Uh, if you pay attention to how these transformations are used, you would say, well, they're equivalent in a mathematical sense. And then how they map to the world, that's a, I mean, that's, that's another question, right? But then, I guess, 
there is a similarity with your view to a certain extent, but they are like paying attention to the mathematical models themselves, mm -hmm. as opposed to here's two space times physical space times related in this way. I don't know if like you you want to comment on that because I feel there's a similar move, but there is you pay attention to the metaphysics, you pay attention to the math, and you yeah, would like to see. Here. Yeah, so this, this, is the, this is the Jim Weatherall stuff. And then uh, Halverson, and then yeah. James Reed, and then, it, yeah, it started with Cooling that. Cooling in there. But yeah. they ended up, yeah, some other comments, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, let's see. I don't think I have a, a, a conflict with them. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I think, let's see. So their view is something like, look, we, we do some math that tells us how space time's going to move. Um, but like all the math stuff, it doesn't have to represent anything at all. And so I think uh, 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 Jim Weatherall's point is something like, look, the whole argument doesn't arise out of general relativity. Um, it arises out of some other weird stuff. Um, I agree, uh, absolutely. Uh, uh, I said the exact same thing in the talk. Um, I think it arises out of our metaphysics, right? And so I think, um, right, uh, uh, I, don't, I don't know about all the other people, but I know Jim Weatherall does not like metaphysics. He doesn't want to do it. Um, and so. I think, look, uh, sure, I think he's right. Um, uh, the mathematicians don't treat these as different possibilities. They treat them as one and the same possibility. So let's find a metaphysics, because Jane doesn't want to do it, so I have to do it. Find a metaphysics that allows us to um, uh, talk in the exact same ways that the mathematicians do. We don't want to say, well, what if I, right, because we can just sort of like push aside all the, um, uh, the general relativity talk. And we could just talk about, like, well, what if I swap the places of these points? these physical things, would that be a different world? Um, and it seems like, uh, no, probably not. No mathematician, no physicist would, would say that that's a different world. They'd say you're sort of you're a bit confused. Um, and so I think we can say the exact same thing. I think this is a metaphysics that sort of, uh, uh, if Jim would read the paper, I think he would he would find it at least amenable to this. Yeah, awesome, thanks. Here. Thanks, Stephen. Um, I think I'm confused about something. So help me out. So it seems like there are two senses of the word subregion. Um, and uh, maybe I'm wrong, but it feels like you're blurring them together. So here, up here, you say no proper subregion exists on the neurological understanding. And by that, you mean it's not a part hook relation, right? It's not like there's subregions that make up the whole. Um, fair, cool. There still seems to be another sense of subregion that is non-mereological that that might apply to the case of symbols. So, like, imagine that this pencil is a mereological symbol. It seems like I can still say this side over here and this side over here. Oh, but you know they're not proper parts. I don't want to say anything. Like that. Okay, if if that's possible, it seems like the whole argument might still come back. Right? It seems like we can say this region or region in the deflated sense, right? Is this, is, does the uh, electron go through this region right here? In the, yeah. So I wonder what you said. Am I confused about these two senses of the term subregion or part? Um, uh, I don't think you're confused about the, 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 I think there is, right, and I, I sort of talk about places yeah. um, uh, despite thinking that they're not sort of existent things. Um, so I think you're absolutely right. So I think, um, uh, I was sort of, I was trucking along with the whole, the whole question. Yep, absolutely, it's like a symbol. Um, Markosian's example is a, a neurologically simple statue of Joe Montana. He talks about the arm uh, being like, like a bit of it, but it's yeah. not a part per se. Um, and I think we can say the exact same thing that Markosian does, which is that that's that's a, a, a conceptual part, but it's not going to be a neurological part. And so uh, the restriction here that helps us out is that. Can't we likely? Very let's see how best to, to frame this. Um, the conceptual parts are going to map with stuff that we can interact with, things that we can see, uh, which are going to be modes. They're going to be occupation relations, which I'm totally down with occupation relations, um, and they're going to be metrical features. So like over there, there's a gravitational web, um, or oh, we just detected a gravitational wave. Uh, those are awesome. We can point to those, um, and those are going to be conceptual parts. But I don't think we can conceptually point to points. Um, I think this is right. We sort of leave that behind. We leave behind uh, uh, Newton. 
right, versus like Galileo, right? We can we can do these boosts, we can do these slide mid shifts. Um, and so I think any subsentitleist is going to have to say something about like, yeah, we you know we can't do everything. Um, we, there are going to be some uh, uh, sort of conceptual possibilities that we want to just like push away. And one of those is just going to have to be, yeah, these conceptual parts we can't identify them across. Possibilities, except by way of their features, except by way of these modes, which are going to be preserved through all dimorphism, so there's never going to be all of them. Got it. So I can't talk about this end of the pencil, I can only talk about the pointy end. Uh, uh, yeah. And so you could never rotate the pencil without changing the features of the pencil. And still talk about And still talk about that end of the pencil. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's right. So thank you yeah. for the talk. Um, so you, you deal with the quotation literature, right? Mm -hmm. But I am a little bit puzzled about the following thing. I mean, you tackled the point concerning Mariology, and as far as I know, as far as I understood your points, uh, we can uh, consider the general extension of Mariology as the basic Mariology that we are uh, committed to with the framework. But why, and I mean, you suggest you get rid of points in favor of uh, simple universe, but since you're dealing with occupational relation, why should not we consider the theories of location, let's say for instance, well, we cannot say that, we, we cannot use the, we cannot use exact location, but we can always avoid the whole argument referring to other locative notions, like weak location or purposive location, so using that in order to skip the whole argument, but using the exact location within a certain representation given by a certain determinant. Let's see. So I think I think we can I think we can recover something like um, exact location. Um, so so the occupation relation is going to be I think in most cases triadic on um, mm -hmm. on the neurological view. Um, so it's going to be between the material object, um, the space time, and then it's going to be like indexed. So it's uh, you know the the object is located in the space-time at the moment. Uh, and so I think we can we can get exact location up and running, um, and whatever other you know, uh, partial location, and, and we can sort of define all of these same concepts once we can get region talk up and running. But it's all going to be conceptual part talk. Right? The, the regions are conceptual. We're just sort of carving up space however we think is useful. Um, uh, or if you, if you think that they emerge, then they're like real things that are going to be there. Um, and then I think the how we carve up is going to be um, uh, determined by the kind of substance that we're talking about. Right, so space-time is kind of uh, freeform. We get to carve up space-time however we like to. Um, something like the electron field, you don't necessarily. Um, right, there are these things that we have to count these, the electrons. Um, and they have special kind of emergence laws that happen. And so space time is kind of this funky one where, yeah, we have to be a little bit more freeform. We have to be able to talk about whatever kinds of regions we like, whatever kind of modes that we want to carve up uh, the world as. Um, but I think we can still recover top of exact location. There are some other concerns in there, though. Uh, yeah, because in many cases, you're attacking the point within your framework. I was suggesting to consider a point, the equivalent class of the other points to which that point is sent through certain different groups, talk about weak location, purposive location, referring to the fusion, the neurological fusion of those points that is granted within your framework, the extension of neurology, but say, well, we can talk about exact location referring to a particular point, because in this particular view, maybe we're committed to a certain representation of space-time. But, mm, very true, okay. We can, yeah, yeah, we can, we can check, yeah. but um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not tracking the, the comparison with, you're comparing it to other views as well, uh, and I'm not seeing the, the connection there. Um, but we're about to do lunch, so, so I'd, I'd love to get lunch and talk about it. Yeah. Okay.